Welcome to Unlocking Musician's Mind from Practice Room to the Stage, a game changing video series that uncovers the psychological and emotional frameworks behind becoming a successful performing artist. This isn't going to be your typical tutorial on uh, how to play scales or arpeggios. Instead, we are diving into the realms of emotional intelligence, positive psychology, and even Jungian shadow work to help you not only perform better, but also to live a more fulfilling, authentic life as a musician. Whether you're just beginning your journey or a more seasoned musician, this series is designed to empower you every step of the way. So today we are going to explore together frequently overlooked aspect of musicianship, the psychological challenges that accompany a life devoted to music. Many of us spend years honing our technical skills and artistic responsibilities. Yet we often neglect the crucial role that psychology and self-awareness play in our journey to becoming accomplished performers. But this isn't just a concern for those of us on the professional track. Even if you are engaged with music purely for the joy it brings, performance anxiety or competitive stress can be stumbling blocks that prevent you from fully exploring this avenue for self-growth and joy. Success in the highly demanding world of musical performance isn't just about hitting the right notes. It's a balancing act that demands both physical prowess and robust psychological well-being. The ability to manage stress, especially in high-stakes situations like auditions and competitions, is indispensable. Here you are pitted against immensely talented individuals and you need more than just technical skills. You need resilience, emotional intelligence and highly developed coping mechanisms. Throughout the history, humans faced physical risks and dangers as part of daily life. Today, we might be safer physically, but many of us grapple with pervasive anxiety that triggers stress and physiological responses. This anxiety goes by various names, fear, phobia, nervousness, panic, but its effects are consistent. It influences both our emotional well-being and our basic cognitive functions like memory and attention. In the United States alone in the 90s, Anxiety impacted over 8% of the population. At that time, it was roughly 18 million. And a few years ago, these numbers were higher. It was approximately 18% of the adult population, and uh, which was approximately 40 million of people. So it's truly widespread. It's not only applicable to musicians or um, public speakers or those who are performing Otherwise, so there are several theories explaining its prevalence. First, many psychologists consider anxiety to be an inherent part of the human condition, given the uncertainties life presents. Second, anxiety is closely tied to our primitive fight or flight mechanism, initially evolved to protect us from physical threats, but now often triggered by psychological ones. As I often would say in the classroom, for our brain, there is no difference whether we meet a lion on the street or go on stage to give a concert. It's exactly the same thing. Sigmund Freud made significant contributions to this study of anxiety, identifying two main types. The first is free-floating anxiety, which manifests as the pervasive, unfocused sense of unease. The second is a more targeted form of anxiety that erupts suddenly, causing acute discomfort. 
Freud expanded on his initial ideas with the development of his signal theory of anxiety. In his theory, he suggests that anxiety functions much like an internal alarm system. It alerts us to potential threats, whether those threats are external, like a high-stakes audition or performance, or internal, such as self-doubt or the fear of failure. By signaling danger, anxiety prompts us to take action, encouraging adaptive behaviors like extra practice, seeking guidance, or mentally preparing for the challenge. For musicians, understanding this signal can be incredibly useful, actually. Rather than viewing anxiety as an obstacle, it can be seen as a cue to engage in behaviors that improve performance, allowing for a more nuanced and thoughtful approach to both practice and public presentation. Moreover, Freud classified anxiety into several subtypes, subtypes realistic, moral, and neurotic. Realistic anxiety is essentially fear, a response to a tangible external threat. Moral anxiety arises from an overly restrictive superego or moral conscience, causing internal tension. Neurotic anxiety, on the other hand, is an exaggerated response to internal emotions and sensations, which are mistakenly perceived as threatening. It will be useful for us to learn about a psychological model known as a stress inoculation training, or SIT, S-I-T, developed by psychologist Donald Meichenbaum. This approach is designed to help people, like musicians, build resilience against stress through three key stages. The first stage is self-assessment, which is a critical but often overlooked step. It's not just about identifying stressors, but also about understanding your own responses to those who evaluate your performances. Judges, teachers, family members or friends. Their feedback can have a significant impact on our self-esteem. And we should keep in mind that self-assessment is constructive. It's not the same as self-criticism. It's about understanding your own motivations, preferences, and future plans as a performer. Uh, examples for self-assessment include personal motives for performing, musical inclinations towards specific genres of composers, um, learning and preparation styles, recognizing individual strength and weaknesses as such. In the second stage, you will learn specific stress management techniques, such as relaxation training and mental visualization. Remember, true relaxation comes not just from a physical state, but from a specific frame of mind that allows you to relinquish some degree of conscious control. The final stage involves applying these newly acquired skills in the real-world situations. There are no shortcuts here. Mastering these techniques require time and effort, much like mastering a musical piece. One effective strategy for implementing these skills is through graded exposure, where you simulate stressful situations in a controlled environment. For musicians, this could mean participating in the practice performances before the actual event, like playing in the studio classes, seminars, um, friendly performances in the houses, extra number of dress rehearsals, uh, recording sessions, and other things that are less stressful than uh, actual performance. As we explore these topics in detail, remember, sit, SIT isn't just about managing stress, it's about gaining a deeper understanding of yourself as a performer. In the following and the last part of this video, we will talk about two techniques that can help us to cope with performance stress.
relaxation can be a double-edged sword for performers. On one hand, it is essential for optimal performance. On the other hand, it could potentially dampen the energy or engagement level you need on the stage. Today, we will explore how relaxation can be a powerful tool, specifically focusing on a technique known as the quieting response. There are three benefits of relaxation in general. Number one, regular relaxation practices can help ease your overall stress levels, making you a more centered performer. Number two, focused relaxation can help you recondition tense muscle groups, enhancing the fluidity of your performance. And three, practicing relaxation can offer instant remedies for moments of tension or stage fright. The quieting response is the quick technique that can counteract tension or anxiety within seconds, fostering a relaxed state. Now, I should add that eventually it can take only a few seconds to achieve that state, but it's going to take several days or weeks of practicing that technique over and over again, mastering it and making your body and mind accustomed to this technique and thus responding more effectively, more efficiently with fewer distractions. So if at the beginning it's going to take you a minute or a few minutes to go through all the steps of this technique, and there are four steps, which I'll tell you in a second, uh, at first it might take a few minutes. A few weeks later of practicing this technique, it could take only five, ten seconds to go through the entire cycle, cycle and feel better, more centered. So the first step of the four is deep breathing. And we should emulate a singer's diaphragm diaphragmatic breath. Inhale and exhale slowly, filling your lungs completely. If you think you're full, try to in inhale even more. Perhaps even use counting to find a comfortable rhythm, like inhale for four or five seconds and then exhale for the same amount of time. Now, second step is dangerous because one can fall asleep. Second step is to cl close your eyes. Don't command yourself to close your eyes. Let it happen naturally and focus on the sensations around your eyes and experiment with how they align with your breathing. So the point here is that rather than just commanding your eyes to shut down and then open up, there are a few negative aspects, counterproductive aspects in this act alone when you're trying to relax and you were, we're forcing something when we're trying hard to relax, we can't relax. When we try hard to fall asleep, we can't fall asleep. So there is a certain element of letting it go, letting it happen. But so the idea is try to synchronize your the movements of your eyelids and your breathing. Similarly, Different example would be, different technique would be, uh, try to synchronize, let's say I put my finger up and then try to synchronize uh, the movement, the folding movement of a finger with your eyelids. As an example. So now it's less of a direct command from your brain rather than something outside of your brain collaborates with your eyelids, so to speak. Now, third step we need to release the tension. Imagine your muscles are rubber bands that naturally won't return to a relaxed state. Whether it's your hand, arm or leg muscles, practice both abrupt and gradual release of tension. Remember, it's about letting go, not forcing it, like I said with the previous step. And once again, you can experiment just... If it's hard for you to tell, whether some group of your muscles is relaxed or not at the moment. Clench your wrist as an example. You can, you can do the same process with different uh, group of muscles. So really put some tension in it and then let it go. And then try to feel the difference of the two states. And you might be able, after such scan, you might be able to capture or catch some groups of the muscles that are actually experiencing some tension despite appearing to be in, in their neutral state. And what it says 
this technique about uh, gradually re relaxing or not, you could decide to gradually clench your wrist or gradually put some tension on the muscles and then gradually release it. This will increase your awareness of the process and of getting, capturing this state of relaxation. Finally, the fourth step is visualizing a pleasant image. Form a vivid mental image and hold it for some time, some seconds, some minutes, depending how much time you have. Make it a part of your relaxation toolkit so it's readily available when needed. You could also imagine walking on the stage that you're about to perform on and in that process, imagine yourself feeling really comfortable and positive about that experience. So we can talk about imaginary, imaginary and visualization or mental rehearsal in the one of the upcoming videos. By dedicating time to fine tune these steps, you will find that achieving relaxation becomes quicker and more effective over time. This isn't just about relaxation, it's about enhancing your performance through mental control and self-awareness. And the second technique I would like us to talk about in this video is called cognitive restructuring. Now, it may have different names in the world out there, but today we will use this one. Our thoughts influence our feelings and vice versa. Throughout the day, we may experience a continuous flow of thoughts, or they also called cognitions. Some are more noticeable and some are less. By focusing on this mental chatter, we can identify recurring themes that may affect our emotional being uh, particularly in performance setting. And examples of such chatter can be practice make perfect, you are only as good as your next performance, and things like that. These thoughts often reflect underlying attitudes and beliefs, subtly shaping our stress and anxiety levels. Common thoughts like, I can't memorize this in time, or my whole career or reputation depends on this performance, encapsulate a broader mindset of performance anxiety. Cognitive restructuring is a technique that brings these maladaptive thoughts and attitudes into conscious awareness. The process involves scrutinizing these thoughts for accuracy and then revising them as needed to better align with reality. There are also four steps of cognitive restructuring for performance. Number one, become aware of your thoughts, feelings, and interpretations of ongoing events. Use a notebook to jot down thoughts as they occur, especially during practice or performance preparation. Number two, Evaluate the accuracy of your thoughts and attitudes by collecting relevant data. This step isn't just about replacing negative thoughts with positive ones. It's about rigorously testing your personal assumptions to determine their validity. Third step. Examine the collected information critically. People under stress or anxiety often distort situations, making it crucial to assess data objectively. For instance, performers with low self-confidence may focus only on details that confirm their self-doubt. Number four, make necessary changes to your thinking patterns based on the evidence you have gathered. For example, instead of thinking, I can't play from memory, you may refine it to, I can play from memory when well prepared and comfortable with the audience. Cognitive restructuring helps you understand the relationship between your thoughts and feelings. As you become more comfortable in your performance setting, you may find that your underlying beliefs start to shift. This is key to managing performance anxiety effectively. There are a few more quick points that I wanted to mention to you. Some of them were already mentioned, but I think it's important for us to quickly 
refresh some of them. Once again, we need to keep a record. We need to write things down and look for recurring themes. Maybe there is a thought, an idea that comes back to your mind on the day of the performance or on the day of the lesson, regardless of how well you were preparing yourself for it in the seven days or six days prior to that. We should understand that thoughts are not equivalent to reality. Okay. Second idea is that, once again, we need to evaluate the evidence, collect data that supports or contradicts your thoughts and beliefs. Number three, conduct small experiments, such as performing in different settings to assess your coping strategies. And probably most important of all, number four, rather than self-criticism, Talk to yourself as you would to a supportive friend facing the same challenges. In the upcoming video lectures, we will discover a few other techniques that you can try. The key here is to be aware of the options that you have and find what is the most effective for your body and mind. If there will be an interest in discussing this in greater detail, in a more personal way, please comment below and I will be happy to do a live stream or a free workshop-like discussion, for example, over Zoom. Happy learning and until next time.